Hey everybody, it's Eric Torenberg, co-founder, partner of Village Global, a network-driven venture firm. And this is Venture Stories, a podcast covering topics relating to tech and business with world-leading experts. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Venture Stories by Village Global. I'm here today with two very special guests, Sheil Manat, a partner at 500 Startups, and Howard Lindzen, uh, co-founder of Stock Twits and Social Leverage. Guys, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Glad to be here. Finally, we made it happen. Also known. I'm okay. I'm not sure. I'm glad to be here. I'll, I'll be, I'll be <laughs> also known as the Jew and the Jane. This episode has been long in the long in the works. Jew and the Jane. <laughs> So you guys have been doing fintech investing for, for a long time. I want to hear about how you approach the fintech space today, where you're most excited about today, but also how that has evolved since you began investing and how this, uh, the, the space has evolved and how that's affected your your thesis and your focus. Shield, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. I guess just thinking through like when Howard started stock twits, fintech wasn't really a word. And same same for me, like when I started uh, payments business in 2009, 10 payments, I think was the only thing that people thought, thought about when, with FinTech, or at least like that was top of mind for me at that time. And FinTech has evolved so much from payments to lending, to Bitcoin, to real estate, all sorts of stuff. It's been interesting. And then I think today sort of around your question, what's interesting today for me, it's all of those things and probably a few things I'm I'm excited about today that I have been for the past six months or so. And Eric, you've heard me talk about this is still sort of underlying technology and infrastructure. I still sort of am a big believer that many companies are not fintech companies today, but could be and should be. And with tools to make them easier, that will happen. So I'm excited about companies building that API layer for banking and they need to exist both in you know in lending, investments, banking. There's companies like Synapse, but there are a lot more that need to come. And, and I'm excited about hopefully investing in that sector. Are you an investor in Synapse? Yeah, I'm a very small investor in Synapse. <laughs> I'm just such a big believer in that space, what they do, which is, for those of you who don't know, it's, it's like an API layer for banking. And opportunities in this space mean, one that I talk about a lot is, Uber drivers. So Uber opens more bank accounts than anyone in the world because drivers, when they sign up, they need to get a bank account to get money in. And if there was a way for Uber to, in the sign up flow, provision a bank account for people, that would be an amazing thing. It would actually uh, streamline their sign up flow. This company Synapse comes along and they build APIs that allow other people to build onto their banking infrastructure. And they, it's not even their banking infrastructure. They actually work with a few different bank partners. So it's a space I'm really excited about. Howard, have you have you invested in anything in the? You've done some API layer stuff, right? No, we didn't do trade it. They were just bought by Trading View. I think it was more Aquahire. I'm definitely looking at some right now. I can't talk about them, but we're looking at investing in a couple. But I saw that entries and just put money in Synapse. I like. I've avoided banking just because you know it's not my workflow. I look at fintech more like you. It's just so broad. I, I consider myself financial services, not fintech. So I yeah. don't do payments. I don't do, I, I've made a few institutional, but because I don't come from the institutional background, I'm just more about solving my own problems as an individual investor. And that's worked for me. So when I think about fintech, I think about, well, how, you know, I've been focused on how does this next generation millennials and now Gen Z think about investing because they're going to inherit all this money from, from their parents and grandparents. And so I think this next generation is going to be an invest, in a, a, you know, a, a, a generation of investors more than how, anything. How do, because, how do you like, how do Max, and Rachel, <clears throat> how do your, how do your kids, do they help you in that regard? Like, the, like, Howard, you're not the future. They did when they lived at home. When they lived at home, I could ask them questions. You know, they're empty nesters, but uh, they read big more ask me questions. So, but but the way I saw it, the, and the way I see the future in in my sector is we went we went from this world where I was running a hedge fund and I had you know screaming at my television, calling out fake news way back, and there were no tools. Right, we had Yahoo Finance and we had I guess E Trade. 
and Schwab from the last generation, and then nothing for 10 years. And then you had, you know, Vanguard kind of destroy the hedge fund industry on a single handedly because in automation and computers. So index investing took over. And then, yep. And then my hypothesis was, well, you know, we're getting total addressable market, which is important to most VCs, but not angel investing. How do I work? How do I get off the desktop? If I'm not going to be a hedge fund manager and I love the markets, um, kind of like, you know, the gaming market, if I love the markets, how do I invest? And you know, we went from a world where you could be on eight screens to them being on one screen. And I think, I think like you mentioned, Uber for banking, I think Robinhood for brokerage finally was the bottom in how small I want to consume the market. We went from like eight screens down to my iPhone, and now we're going to go back into the expansion mode where all these onboarded people are, who've been onboarded on an iPhone are going to need more information. Real and stuff. Yeah, yeah. so we're going to have a rebirth of the desktop in a way, kind of like gaming, where you know I may not have eight screens, but I want two screens on my desk because I'm managing a lot of money. And there's a lot of cool stuff from social networks to charting to data to trading. So we hit the peak, you know, kind of like with Uber and with Robinhood, we kind of hit peak small screen. And now we're yeah. going to go back. So I think, I think mapping, you know, how do people find their next trade? So kind of like the Google Maps of investing is going to be next. And so we've made some investments there, one being Coifin. Uh, which is seed seed investment that we made, which is kind of like a next generation free Bloomberg, and so we're really excited about this this move away from one screen maybe to two screens. How are they going to make money if it's free? Uh, well, I think how any company now in the consumer space is going to make money, you're going to have to you're going to have to go with subscription model, okay. and pack, you know yeah. there's going to be all kinds of bundles. Uh, I think we're going to get back into the bundling phase. And and there's one industry where people will pay. You know, there's content, obviously, is proven. And then, obviously, helping people make money. People people pay for that. People have always paid subscription services for, for, for financial content and data. So that's a proven model. When you, when you saw Robinhood, what was it, like eight years ago now? Something like that. No, it's 2013. It, it really was late. Six like, years ago. Yeah. Yes, it was um, really shocking to me. When we started Stock Twits, the whole the whole thinking was I can't believe, you know, when we saw Twitter and started Stock Twits, the, the whole thinking was I can't believe that I mean this is a social Bloomberg. And so we were pretty shocked that and I think because the VCs in America went for the assets under management model, they went chasing Vanguard as as the total addressable market was assets under management. I think what they got wrong, uh, and I think they're really wrong is that although you could build a great app to mimic the S&P 500, the customer acquisition costs were still too high, and it wasn't a 10 times better product than uh, Vanguard. I think what Robinhood got right, and even though it was late, was that people wanted to do it themselves. And eToro was probably the first to market in 2009 with kind of a do-it-yourself mobile brokerage uh, but it was rest of the world, not U.S. And I think what held back U.S. is, you know, in a world where uh, gray means go for like Uber and Lyft and all the ride sharing and Airbnb and WeWork, I think for brokerage, when the SEC is involved, gray means, you know, be careful. It took a team that was going to go do software, and, you know, build the infrastructure first before you, you couldn't just go say we're going to do free trading because the SEC would shut you down. So I think why it took so long here was no one wanted to do the hard work of going to get the SEC and FINRA. And now we enter, this is where Synapse and Plaid and all these companies now will work, is now people can go and copy Robinhood and, and kind of table stakes to build a broker dealer now. So that we went from an era where no one wanted to be a broker dealer, where now it's table stakes. But like, I mean, there's still, Robinhood was on apex until less than a year ago right so like there's still it seems like there's an opportunity for that for there to be a broker yeah i don't know yes there's there's drive well which is you yep. know, backed by 0.72 yep there's a bunch of them that no one's ever heard of and then but yes there is no kind of like twilio flash synapse for broker dealers so it's kind of a problem that we've been looking for to get yeah. solved so i'm pretty yeah. excited about that 
and StockTwits itself has announced a broker dealer. We call it the Trade App. And so you'll be able to trade right from StockTwits, kind of the first social network to ever have a broker dealer. So that should be launching in July. We've got 100,000 plus people already signed up for it. How big is StockTwits? Like, what's the evolution been? Uh, it's been slow, I think, because the whole, like I said, the whole U.S. industry has been slow in the U.S., right? In China and, and Asia, it's just like, you know, gray means go. So they've been less worried about that. It's more of a gambling culture, too. <clears throat> in the U.S., you got to go through the SEC and FINRA. The, so so StockTwits, you know, didn't want to be a broker. Like, I, when I was CEO and founder, I didn't want to be a broker dealer. I figured Fox, a broker dealer would buy StockTwits or that uh, we merge with, you know, a broker dealer partner. But now, you know, 10 years later, it's easier to just build one. So the evolution has been slow. There's 2 million members, about half a million. I don't, I'm not up to date on the latest numbers this month, but, you know, around half a million active logged in users. Uh, so it's a pretty big audience. You know, Bloomberg's only 300,000 paid. Uh, so, so the market's the much money. smaller. What's that? Bloomberg has uh, a few hundred thousand people paying a shitload of money. It's oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the best business in the world. It's the original yeah. social network. One well, question I have for, for both of you is, where do you see the white space in terms of entrepreneurs who are listening to this and want to build a company in the fintech space? If, if they said, hey, Sheil, Howard, I'll follow any space you, you find super interesting. I'll build a company there and, and let you invest in it. And it's a really great entrepreneur who has the relevant skills to build any business. Where, where would you point them? Where are you most excited to see this is built? Well, I mean, I think fintech is pretty crowded personally, at least in the space that I want to until, because even if, let's say, Coinbase, Robinhood, eToro have onboarded, let's say, and StockTwits have onboarded 30 million new millennial Gen Zs around the world in uh, investing, let's say, only 3 million, 1 to 3 million sick and really want to have a desktop experience. You're not talking about a huge addressable market. You have massive deflation in the assets under management and fee space. So that's a terrible space uh, unless you're unique and niche and and offer, you know, valuable advice and services. So I think financial services are really hard and crowded space right now. And the fact that the platforms have all closed makes marketing really expensive for customer acquisition. I'm pretty careful. I mean, unless you have true domain experience, I think financial services is going to be a really hard space for the next you know, five, 10 years, because I think a lot of the winners have been anointed. But obviously, like I said earlier, you know, the mapping, like helping people make their next decisions are, is an interesting, you know, and maps is a huge category. So mapping of ideas, but I think it's a pretty tough category and I haven't seen that many great ideas there. So I'm pretty, I'd probably try and talk most fintech entrepreneurs out of the market right now. Payments are crowded. Plumbing is getting crowded very quickly. Andres, all the big names are starting to invest in this space. And the non-bank banks in the U.S. and Robinhood have such a huge uh, lead that I think I think there's better categories. And that's me talking to investors, pitching me. I mean, I'm bullish, but I also want to try to prevent. I'm, I don't want entrepreneurs to go down this hard path when there's easier paths potentially. That's my two cents. It does feel like on the consumer side there's like most of these apps are going to converge on a similar set of features. There's some component of investing, some component of savings, some component of lending. So if you look at like in the consumer fintech space, I'll say like stash acorns, digit Albert Wealthfront. these companies all are converging on a similar feature set. And then there's actually, there's like Dave and Bridget on the lending side too. Yeah. It'll be, it'll be interesting to see. I think, to your point, there are only so many millennials if, the, if they're all going after the same audience. There are only so many of them. And CACs have increased significantly over the past year. And that's been yeah. great. And you're, you're leaving out SoFi and Robinhood who are at totally. time and all this, yeah. who are going to converge. I think it's much easier for like a Robinhood to go into the other spaces that because they have all the users than it is for SoFi and a digit and acorns to move into the Robin Hood space. So I think, I think, I think what people are, are missing is it's, you know, and then I, so I really think it's crowded and I really think we're being nice 
Shill and I probably by saying it cax high, cax redonkulous. And because millennials, you know, they may be a customer for 60 years, but I doubt it because millennials have zero, there's zero switching costs. So I can switch from Wealthfront to Betterment if someone looks at me the wrong way or talks to me the wrong way, or I can go from Acorn to Robinhood, meaning, you know, what, what made the app, what made FinTech so cool for a while is also going to be its undoing because there's no switching costs. Everybody's working on, you know, you can switch in one minute. Yeah. But that, that's consumer fintech, I think. So, I mean, we talked a little bit about the plumbing. I think the plumbing does a big unlock because if you build the fintech plumbing, it means that non-fintech apps can have fintech. So, you know, any retailer can add lending or insurance onto their offering, which Absolutely. is often is is often valuable. Oh, there but that'll be great for incumbents. That'll be great for incumbents. It's true. I've been interested in a bunch in sort of the real estate space, not even necessarily fintech applications of real estate. Where? A month ago, at 500 Startups, we had all these companies coming in for the new batch of, of startups accelerator that they do. And all these guys are staying in Airbnbs or hotels in San Francisco and you know spending 150 bucks a night. And I was thinking, like, real estate in San Francisco is so expensive. There's got to be a better way. And I was thinking through like Japan, these capsule hotels. So these are these are like a little sleep pod, a little bit bigger than your own bed, but extremely popular in Japan where people just go and because real estate's expensive, like the, the, these things popped up in the past 50 years and they become really popular. So it's a really small hotel room. So think about like, what, what did we work do for real estate? We worked, took the standard person needs like 150 square feet per office in a standard office. And we work does it in 60 square feet and they do it because they give you a nicer experience and they've designed it in an optimal way. I've been thinking about creating a WeWork for hotels, which is basically a optimized sleep pod. So if you're, if you're staying in a hotel, you, you might be traveling. So you might have time zone issues, et cetera. So this thing has the perfect light the perfect sound, perfect oxygen built for you in a really small space. And you put a bunch of them so you can fit five in the space of a regular hotel room and then charge under a hundred bucks a night for this thing. So anyway, this is one idea I've been thinking about, not in the FinTech space at all. Yeah, I think for international cities in the U.S., that would be huge. That's cool. So you, you mentioned sorry, uh, that you're really excited infrastructure. What, what are the businesses that don't exist today will be big in, in, in that space or don't exist at scale? Yeah, so we talked briefly about the broker dealer space. I think that there's still an opportunity there. Drive Wealth is is a company in the space. I think there's probably more room for, room for more than one. Basically, making it easier for others to create Robinhood in the lending space. I think there's a lot that could be figured out on the API in the API space where you could do lending as a service. So all these new new companies or, or companies companies could add lending into the service. So an example would be Airbnb. You need money to improve your residence and you, they know you'll make more money from it. A company could be basically capital markets and underwriting in a box for Airbnb. And they could basically plug into the API. They could see the consistent flows from somebody's, somebody earning money from stays and give them a loan. So I think there's an opportunity to build a company in that space that I'm excited about. Yeah. Howard, you know, you're... Your Twitter handle is Blockchain Linzen. So I thought I'd ask you first, how are you viewing crypto and, and where do you see the opportunity? I know you guys are in Civic. Yeah, we're in Civic. We're in a company called CoinMine, which we're really bullish on, which is kind of a starting out as like a weird hobbyist uh, kind of gaming machine to help people, you know, print their own currencies at home, mine their own currencies. Uh, it's doing really well, you know, it's starting very narrow. Uh, market, but they're building an OS for mining, which is really cool. Big, great team. But you know, my my take on crypto is I'm super long term bullish, mainly because of the people that have kind of staked a claim there. There's a lot of reputation risk on the line. The people who didn't need to take reputation lit risks. If I look at the exchanges, so well, if I look at any of the railroads today, like railroads themselves are at all time highs. Visa, Mastercard, all time highs. And CME, ICE, 
NASDAQ, the exchanges, all-time highs. So you have this convergence of all-time highs amongst exchanges. And, and in a way, the you know, cryptid certain blockchains are, are going to be those future you know, railroads. And so you, you have to have some money, even though the industry itself is so tiny at two, three hundred billion, it's less than the size of, of Facebook. So, you know, it's still in relative terms a penny stock. And as with all penny stocks, I say really be careful. But I think I think Bitcoin has got the best brand in terms of like survivability at this point. And it's hard to tell what it's worth. You know, is it worth five hundred or one hundred or fifty thousand? I don't really know. But I do feel there's something there in in just that sense of, you know, people are gonna be building on top of these blockchains and whoever owns these chains, whether they have true cash flow value or not. You know, at the beginning, the seats on the exchange were worth a lot of money. Uh, and people thought people were crazy for owning seats on the exchange. But I think people who own the the blockchains are are, 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 are going to profit, or at least the winning blockchain. So I'm bullish. But at the same time, I'm not smart enough to go bet on new ones. And I'm more waiting for, if, if crypto industry hits $2 trillion, uh, there's going to be a lot more opportunity than there was at uh, crypto 300 billion because there'll just be more people using it at that point. You know, we've hit the bubble phase where we then we crash. So speculation now moves to all right. We got our asses kicked. What really matters? And what really matters is you know they got to get the speed of the networks working and the cost of transactions down. And so there's not going to be another bubble until that stuff is solved. But if we look out 100 years from now, which is, you know, the banks don't want to, can't fathom to look out 100 years because, you know, they'll be dead, the CEOs. So why invest in it? I think, I think in 100 years, we'll all look back like at the railroads and go, you know, decentralized types of assets are important. What do you see in CoinMine? I, help me understand it because I, I, it seems like a beautiful product that, is basically just a beautiful crypto miner, right? But like, who are their customers? Because that's what I can't figure out. Well, I mean, again, the customer, remember, it's a seed investment. So the customers are people like me who are, who are like skeptical, don't care about what it costs to produce one. I just don't have a, a tangible way of understanding it. So it's more um, for educational purposes and uh, aha moments. Uh, the idea that I can plug this thing in in the background and, you know, a wallet pops up that's secure and it's printing me money. And, you know, when they close the loop and I can start paying bills with that or paying off bets with that or converting that to cash and can coin mine become no different than Robinhood eventually. If everything else is becoming a commodity and my coin mine is my bank. Then it might as well be a you know coin mine could be anything because it's got an angle of attack which at least gets me saving. It's kind of like toaster ovens back you used to get a toaster when you opened a bank account when I was five yep. years old. So I don't know if it'll be coin mine or if Google or Amazon will just end up uh, becoming the banking industry and and private labeling these and giving people the power to to print money. But it was more for us just speculation on what is a good angle of attack into this whole industry, assuming that there are no winners yet and you know unique angles of attack at customer acquisition and education are, are key that was our our, our play on coin mine yeah makes sense she uh how have you viewed crypto and how do you view it now i, I think probably similar to howard i think like I, I still think of course we're like in the very early days of crypto or blockchain uses i still you know i have the sticker on my laptop that is do I need blockchain for this? And then it's just a flow chart that says no, because the vast majority of stuff that they get pitched on blockchains, and, and this has gone down a lot in the last like year and a half since, since um, the, the crazy hype of December 2017. But I think the vast majority of stuff I get pitched does not need to be on, on blockchain. I still am bullish on the potential for blockchain applications. And I personally hold Bitcoin I think everyone should have a couple percent of their net worth in Bitcoin because there's the potential for it, for it, it to 
have an outsized return. And I think about it like, like I would think about a venture bet. Like there's some, some potential for an outsized return. Might as well make an investment there. I'm not doing a whole lot more in the blockchain space though. I was fortunate in that I wrote a small check to Coinbase early on. And uh, that's been an amazing run. And subsequently I've invested in this company called Spring Labs, which is a blockchain based credit bureau that I'm, I'm still excited about. And then I've largely stayed out of the space. I'm, I'm curious how you think about uh, companies that help people buy, store, uh, sell, you know, brokerage for, for crypto. How do you think about sort of uh, incumbents versus crypto native companies? And, and broadly, how do you think about just incumbents versus uh, startups in, in fintech financial services generally? Uh, how, how are you seeing sort of bearish that in consumer fintech, the startups will win versus, versus Robinhood or other you know, incumbents who are now no longer startups in the same way. How do you think about that? I think it's interesting that like all these companies that are relatively new to us are actually now the incumbents. So you talked about like incumbents coming into crypto. Well, uh, sort of Robinhood didn't start out in the crypto space, but for a long time, I got a lot of pitches from companies that were going to planning to be the Robinhood for crypto. And then, well, Robinhood's the, the Robinhood for crypto. And I think we're seeing... A lot of a lot of these fintech companies playing the incumbent part um, better than traditional incumbents did. So, if I think about Stripe building the plumbing, they're they're a company that I'm genuinely worried about. When I when we've talked about this API layer, Stripe, I'm worried could actually go out and build all this stuff. They could they could actually even start a bank and build this infrastructure on top of it. So, I, I actually do worry about incumbents quite a bit in the fintech space in a way that I did not before because these companies are still nimble and yet have a lot of capital. Do you see us in a sort of a great consolidation phase or more consolidation coming? There's definitely more consolidation coming. Like sort of what we talked about earlier on the consumer side, all these consumer businesses are converging into a similar set of features. So there's going to be consolidation coming. I see it on like, I don't see any big moves happening on the horizon this year, but I think probably next year we'll see stuff. Yeah, I'm really disappointed. Google had Google could have run the table in finance and kind of totally never gave it a never gave it a real effort. It's disappointing. I think the stock price. I mean, Google has is a great company, and I'm long Google, and I'm disappointed because you know, I think they've done a great job in travel, but they've they've done a terrible job in sports and finance, and those are two of the biggest verticals that they could have owned. Yeah, Google and, Finance. Uh, it's gone to absolute shit. It's a, it's a, well, it's not just Google. It wasn't, that, it was never that great for, yeah. for the right, for the people that are calling it, that telling it as it is and saying it's gone to shit. It really wasn't much to start with based on where yeah. it's gone. Yeah. Who was always better than him. Yeah. Which just says a lot. And exactly, yeah. look at Yahoo. It's worthless. Say more. And what so, have they done? It, well, I just think they, they hired executives to run Google finance and they really just, didn't need to do much. They just needed to, I mean, listen, they could go tomorrow and buy Robinhood because that's a utility in a way. And they would be the leading, they could pay 10, 20, but wouldn't matter what they pay because now they'd be, I'm just shocked that one of the majors hasn't bought a Robinhood because Robinhood's focused on being a utility and building out the stack. So maybe in the end, as, as Sheila and I are thinking about this, it's like in the end, the consolidation is yet to happen. I think there's so, and I think the consolidation that all these startups think is going to happen is going to surprise them because it's going to be more aqua hires than big acquisitions and the big acquisitions will come from the planets. So it's really tough time to be in the middle. It's a great time to be an early stage startup. If you're well capitalized, it's a great time to be a planet like Google because Google can sit back and, and pay for this. Uh, whereas on the banking side, if you're Goldman Sachs, no matter how much you execute, if you look at the stock price, no matter how much Goldman Sachs executes, every business they get into is much lower margins than the core business they ever had. So the stock price, they're in this death spiral with the stock because they can't move fast enough to a new economy world. And the new economy world has much worse margins than their old theft margins uh, of trading against all their clients, et cetera, and being the, uh, being the Google of they were basically the Google of, of finance. And now that Google can be the Google of finance, they've kind of shied away from it, which is disappointing. 
Well, I think about like so think- Google's mission is to organize the world's information and make it accessible. They're doing a piss poor job of that in the finance space. Yeah, like, it's and so hard can- to find like to find the right information that somebody needs to even live their life. Like, if I just think about like questions that people ask me on Facebook all the time, like Google should have solved for this already. Like, what's the difference between term and term life insurance? Like, how do I how do I buy life insurance? All the all these things. Google, I think, is doing a poor job of, and it's it's especially bad for them because finances, of course, is a, a great way to make money. Like lead gen in finance is a yeah, and I think they're going to come there. I think they'll be forced to get into finance, and I think when they finally do it, they'll 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 be great at it because they have the day, they can afford the day that they have the machines running everything. They can buy or build better UIs like a Coifin or a Bloomberg. They won't buy a Bloomberg, but I mean, a co- like figure out how to do how to do UI, and just like they've done with travel, I think they'll figure it out. And I'm disappointed though, like like uh, we were talking about like insurance. How is Google not competing against Geico yet? You know what I mean? Now, obviously, they're making a fortune off of Geico. I'll probably flip the switch at some point, and all these insurance companies and compete. But uh, I think everybody's gotten a free ride with Google not being in that business. And then Twitter itself just completely is fucked up and left. I mean, they could have dominated finance themselves and in terms of real time uh, information and have chosen to sell ads instead. So I think consumer finance has been a little lucky that the incumbents have done a bad job. Where do you guys disagree or or see the world differently between either fintech financial services or, or investing? Howard has these like crazy ideas of what the future is going to look like. And I, the, the thing, I guess the thing is like history shows that he works, it works out once out of every so many times Howard's right. But the vast majority of things like this rally road, Howard's excited about this company rally road. He's an investor in it. I don't believe that it makes sense for people to be investing in fractions of a car, a sports car. It just doesn't make any sense to me. Like it's, it, how do you know where to value the car? Like, it's not like the stock market where we have the government involved. So there's, there's, um, we know what the price of the, of the stock actually is. This is just like a artificial market that is created through this app. And why would I want to buy a piece of a car that I can't drive? And okay, now you're just starting up. <laughs> You make a good question. Like, exactly. I think that's the joy of this, though, the way Shil and I joke about it is, well, first of all, to answer Shil's question, I don't know if he's joking. I think he's pretty serious because you might have looked at the deal. But my belief, and I think crypto brought this along, too, is fractional ownership. So what crypto did a great job of, they've done a terrible job marketing with Satoshis and whatever the fuck you call these things. But Vanguard had this idea already. They've been fractionalizing shares forever, but you got to buy their package. You got to buy it in an S and P 500 package. So just like the institutions, financial institutions, to lock this down for themselves. But why shouldn't me, the customer, be able to buy an S and P 490 fund and kick out the 10 banks, meaning exclude rather than include, right? And so the future is coming where everybody can build their own. Why should I have Wealthfront or Betterment when I can just unbundle the S&P 500 and take out the companies that I hate? Why should I own Nokia as part of the S&P 500? Or why should I own some crap software company that, and wait till the S&P kicks it out when I know it should be kicked out already? So along those lines, fractional ownership of everything from real estate to hard assets is coming. And on one end of the world, you have Robinhood. On the other end of the world, you have crypto. So you have decentralized and you have fully uh, centralized brokerage and along the other end along the spectrum will be a uh, fractional ownership cars was a logical place to start because uh, it's a hundred billion dollar market of which 10 billion turns over every year and there is a hinkley index and the car industry is actually rather liquid and changes hands often and there's a price index called the hinkley index so uh, all kidding aside R- rally row was a genius attack uh, taking all the lessons they learned from Robin, but first building a broker dealer, then creating a, a marketplace and an incredible UI. Obviously, the hard part for Rally Road is building trust and creating secondary markets. But you know, in ten years of Rally Road just doing cars, I'd be surprised. So, as Phil yeah. mentioned earlier, if I'm already a customer, and I have ten grand in Rally Road. 
it's much easier for Rally Road to become a stockbroker than it is for Robinhood to get into the fractional hard asset business. So again, I think the only way to disrupt a Robinhood, uh, not that I'm investing to disrupt Robinhood, but I'm investing to to find the next Schwab's and E-Trade. It's much easier for a coin mine or a Rally Road to become a Robinhood in the next 10 years than it is for a Rally Road than it is for a Robinhood to become a coin mine or a, a Rally Road. So that's my thesis on why fractional ownership and why weird weird industry angles of attack are way better than just creating another digit or acorn or stash or wealthfront or sofi or betterment. Yeah, makes sense. How much do you think fractionalization will will take off? Like in, in what other industries might it work or, or where, where will it not work? Or how, how else do you think about fractionalization? Well, I think just quickly, one last uh, is like people think in dollars. Like why why should I think in one share? Like Amazon's already figured this out. You know, they're copying Warren Buffett. Uh, Salesforce figured it out. They used to split their stock 20 years ago. Splitting the stock is a stupid. It doesn't mean anything. So Amazon will never split their stock again. So how can someone, other than owning the S&P 500, who has two, who has a thousand dollars to start investing, buy Amazon in today's world? They can't. That is ridiculous in 2019. So that is the problem. That problem is only going to get more pronounced as great companies copy. Stock splitting didn't matter. Amazon doesn't give a shit if you own their stock. Okay, it's a privilege, not a right. And now. If they screw up that privilege, the stock will go down and become affordable to the person who wants, you know, but while Amazon's executing, they care less about their stock. That's up to you if you want to own their stock to go figure it out. And so it's up to the new companies to make these on-ramps available. But the joke is, the joke is the Vanguard S&P 500, that people have been sold this vanilla as the only alternative instead of do-it-yourself investing, whereas you know, I want to own fifteen hundred dollar stocks and above because those are the best performing stocks of all time. What are other weird approaches? Uh, you, you mentioned fractalization. You, meant, you mentioned uh, one of the coin mine is taking other sort of weird angles that you've you've been excited about or, or, or want to see people experiment with. Howard kind of sold me on the rally road thing. Actually, like, okay, this is a bet on fractal fractalization. It happens to work well in this first market that we're starting which is cars, will it work in others? Who knows? But I guess one that I've seen that is super interesting is Pando pooling. So Pando allows a group of individuals to pool their future incomes together and give a share out to the pool, which will be shared amongst everyone. So the first market is Major League Baseball, or rather baseball in general, people who get drafted into Major League Baseball. And a group of people can form a pool and they'll, they'll adjust based on where you are in the draft. And if somebody makes it really big, the whole pool gets paid out 10% of their salary for, for life, I believe. So this is a super interesting concept. It's like reimagining social security, but via a pool. And so where they've started is Major League Baseball. Because in this in Major League Baseball, there's a lot of disparity. But where they're going to go next, apparently, is MBA students, another group that may want to level the, level themselves amongst the others. Yeah. What, what, what do you guys think about ISAs or, or pool, uh, pooling or you know future of income share agreements? They're like people as an asset class, basically. It's not for me. I'm not interested in it, but it's cool. Someone's going to solve it. I like the ISA market. I think I don't necessarily like. ISAs for traditional four-year education that we have today. I like ISAs as a component of education. And the reason I like it is it aligns incentives. So like if the purpose of a trade education is to get a job, then you're fully aligned with the institution. So that's, that's the piece I like about it. I think the folks who are building ISA programs for traditional universities, I'm not sure it makes a lot of sense because we already have a very well established student debt a student debt program in the US so i'm not sure that i say is a solution there other than folks who are particularly risk averse maybe zooming out a bit we were talking earlier about how google missed uh, missed an opportunity do you expect any of the major sort of tech incumbents of today google you know amazon facebook microsoft uh, et cetera, uh, apple to make major moves in in in, in financial services or fintech 
that uh, beyond what they've done already in the next few years? Like, do do you fear them really? Yeah, I think Amazon keeps trying, and they test banking and lending. I think they'll end up buying their way in, or with crypto, you know, like with coin. I mean, there's no doubt that. Amazon will get into the crypto space now that Facebook, if Facebook gets any traction. So I think the planets can sit back and kind of wait on these humongous bets. They don't have to make, they can take little shots at trying to do it themselves and then sit back and wait. But at some level, they're going to be forced into making moves. Finance is too big a space. Uh, All things finance, payments, lending, investing, uh, education. They're just too big a space for them to ignore. So I'm excited about that. I don't know who, you know, Tencent and Ali, Tencent has already done that with uh, WePay and Alibaba has done it with Alipay, but the rest of the world is still so fragmented. But in the meantime, Visa, MasterCard, or, you know, stocks that I've owned have been, have been tremendous assets because they are the railroads in the United States, North America, at least. And, you know, they, I know they're too big to get bought and they're too big to get disrupted. So, you know, the U.S. is just a lot different than Asia. Yeah, I mean, I think we've seen, like, just these companies are so big and powerful that whatever they do will be big. And so we saw that, I mean, we're, it's, it's early, but we'll see what happens with the Apple card. Obviously, garnered a lot of hype from the press. I'm actually not that impressed with the card itself. I don't think there's that much that's very unique. But clearly, like, that you know, there are people are excited about some aspects of it. Google has been, as we said, I think they've been asleep at the wheel. They've really missed a big opportunity to be in the payment space. You know, they they tried a few times to launch like a Venmo like product, but they have failed at it again and again. Amazon is there both in payments and insurance and lending, and I think they're going to be a bigger player. Facebook, I, I haven't been following the Facebook coin stuff too att- intently, but they obviously have big aspirations there. You, you mentioned Venmo. I, I've been wanting, and maybe Howard, I'm curious what you think about this, someone, uh, to build a real social network, like basically Twitter for money. I, I find what people spend money on very interesting, <laughs> very, very telling. Yeah. And um, do, do we think this idea will exist uh, at scale anytime soon? Somebody tried to yeah, launch I mean, something like that called Blippy back in the day where you could connect up your credit card stuff and it would actually post online like where you're spending money. Like, I don't, I don't think there was anything commercially there for that business, but somebody tried it many years ago. Yeah, I think when you see Stockfix launch their brokerage in July, August, like widely distributed, you'll see some of the ways social and trading really, you know, with the size of our community and the ability for people to share their trades, I think you'll see some really interesting data and some really interesting networks develop, smaller networks develop around good investors and good traders. Uh, Stuff that Twitter could have done back in 2009 that's finally starting to happen now at a nicher level. I don't think it's something that needs to be so big, right? Like, I don't need to follow a million people. I just need to follow the right 10. So I I think it's going to be much more distributed. There won't be like one giant trading social network. There'll be many of them. It's really, and and, and, as you see, it makes a lot of sense, but I I meant even bigger than trading, just like what Venmo, like I go on the Venmo feed a lot and like people's. You just like to see what your friends are up to? Yeah, basically. I wonder if that will become uh, a way that people connect or you know share realize that they share common interests or i think it already is i mean it is kind of cool to watch i do that same thing so i don't open venmo that often but when i do i scroll so i mean venmo it's i mean that's why paypal's a hundred billion dollar company so i think i think a lot of it even if it's not happening on venmo venmo's getting the benefit of the doubt there's um in i own a stock out of uh brazil pags pags it's kind of like the merchant payment merch kind of square like an older version of square meets paypal but for e-commerce in in brazil and the stock's doing amazing so there's there's all kinds of these networks springing out it's amazing venmo when my company got acquired by groupon we actually looked at acquiring venmo back in 2012 and venmo actually got acquired for not that much money it was 26 million bucks bought by braintree yeah. and then got acquired into into paypal but Venmo almost got shut down. They were running out of money. Betaworks was the where it was incubated. 
Yeah, and they had they had like thirty thousand users, and they were in danger of getting shut down because they were running out of money. And just it just yeah. happened to get picked up by Braintree, which then got picked up by PayPal, and they've put billions of dollars into it at this point. But it's amazing because they had pretty humble beginnings. Yeah, no, I mean it's, an, it's a rare ten year overnight success, which everybody kind of dreams of if you hang around the hoop long enough. They say, but it it had a simple enough UI and functionality that that's what made it great in the end. Yeah, you know the lesson is. You know, it was ignored, but the reason it was successful and still it was so dead simple. Is there any part of crowdfunding that you guys are bullish on? I, I say I, I, I miss the whole crowdfunding buzzword. I was uh, at Kiva. I was one of the first employees of Kiva back in 2005, five six, And we were crowdfunding loans for people in the developing world. But we this crowdfunding wasn't a term. And it really came around and there became equity crowdfunding and, and peer-to-peer loans was crowdfunding at the time. And then there's the Kickstarter product product crowdfunding. It was just the Kiva guys and I always talk about how we just completely missed the, missed the boat with that, that phrase. There's nothing at the moment that I'm really excited about crowdfunding-wise, though. I think around the institutional size, it's, it still works. We're investors in Apple Pie Capital, which was crowdfunding for franchisee franchisor but it's become more institutional and uh produce pay same thing but has become you know for farming has become more institutional both companies are doing well but you know it's just what happens so i mean evolved. like all these businesses that start out as peer-to-peer end up become yeah. like end up realizing that there's no point in having the peers provide capital onto the platform because they're institutions exactly. that can do it better yeah. So what I've learned is maybe it was too early and it'll come back one more time around, but yeah, it doesn't interest me. I've tried and I've gotten lucky maybe a few times in, in, in the pivots or the natural evolution of the crowdfunding, but it doesn't interest me. It doesn't interest me. I think where it can make sense though, is we have really great institutional markets for debt. We don't have them for equity. So if something like what we were talking about earlier in the ISA space takes off, crowdfunding will be a better way to fund that in the short term. Hello, Rally Road. <laughs> Why don't we have great institutional options for equity? It's just never been, it's, it's traditionally been a hard to value asset and we had debt. So like we didn't need equity. We didn't want equity in humans. We had debt to take care of that. And now if all of a sudden equity and all these things that didn't have equity before becomes a thing, then there are no markets that, that can price that risk accordingly. So that's where humans can come in and, and crowdfunding makes sense. One last question then maybe to, uh, you mentioned earlier about, you know, consumer fintech being, being super cr- uh, crowded uh, for the entrepreneurs out there who, who want to build a uh, business in the space. Where are you super bull- bullish or where are you going to be uh, super bullish uh, in the future? You expect, like I said, for me, it's the person, it's the team, it's the domain experience at this point, because we're late into this. A lot of winners have been funded and have their million customers. So it would have to be a really unique angle of attack. So it'll come from someone with a domain experience or a unique problem. And then even in consumer, so so for me, it's still mostly consumer and this evolution from the small screen back to the bigger screens maybe, and the mapping, you know, the idea generation and education, and maybe even the right media angle of attack at finance. You know, with Cheddar getting bought for two hundred million before it really even got off the ground that much. I think John did a great job, but there's still, you know, Alley Insider got bought, Cheddar got bought, Wall Street, my company got bought before that, but there's still no real media incumbent to like CNBC, which is just horrific. So now it's still a niche market in the, in in, the, in that sense, meaning a lot of people don't want to come for that because it's you know Comcast. It's a it's a fly on Comcast's ass. The size of Com, you know what CNBC is to Comcast. So it takes a peculiar type of person to to want to go into fintech because the valuations are going to be much lower too. This uh, this episode has been with Howard Lenzen and Shil Manat. Guys, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Thanks, Shil. Thanks, Eric. If you're an early stage entrepreneur, we'd love to hear from you. Please hit us up at villageglobal.vc slash network catalyst. 